Our discussion of conservative fields in three dimensions is going to boil down to one theorem that says that the following four conditions are equivalent. Just like in two dimensions, the one of the conditions, the last one, is going to look a bit different because the last one in two dimensions was qx equals py, if you recall, and that doesn't make sense for a field that has three components, p, q, and r. So let's see what it's going to be replaced by. So um, let's start right away with the theorem. Uh, the following are equivalent. Or may maybe we do need to add, let's add it up here. So F equals P, Q, R, a three-dimensional field. And we're going to assume that it's continuous um, on... A re on a region or on a domain on a region and let's call it V to emphasize that it's three-dimensional so that those are our assumptions for now so the, fo the following are equivalent we met this abbreviation before one F is conservative By definition, saying that a field is conservative, that was our definition, was the integral over any closed curve gamma. Of course, gamma has to be contained in the region V. That's where our discussion holds. So the integral, the line integral over any closed curve, gamma equals zero. Okay, that was the definition of a conservative field. Remember? Two, this should look extremely familiar because there's nothing 3D in, in what I wrote so far. This was exactly the same for 2D. Uh, the integral over some path AB of F does not depend on the path, or the curve, from A to B. So if you do work along some curve connecting two points A and B, it's going to be the same work whether you take this path, or this path, or this path, or whatever. Okay? Still, nothing indicating that we're doing something 3D here. Same thing for 2D. Okay? Three, F has a potential function, meaning F is the gradient of some scalar function. Okay? In which case, in which case, we even know how to calculate the line integral. The integral over some path AB of F dot dr equals the potential at B minus the potential at A. Remember? Everybody remember this stuff? And again, nothing, I, I could have replaced this with a 2, and there's no hint that this is happening in three-dimensional space rather than on the plane. Okay? Now comes the difference. So these are equivalent under these requirements only. If in addition, if in addition, F is C1 on V, and so this is, was, this is a, a slightly stronger requirement on the field, and there was a, a requirement on the domain. Do you remember what it was? Exactly. And V is simply connected then the following three are equivalent to four and we have to decide what four is. So this is going to be a mystery for a few minutes. Okay? Now, 
I just want to remind you what simply connected means. Simply connected means that for any path you take, you can find the surface for which that path is a boundary. Okay? If you remember, we, we drew the, the torus, for example, where if you take a curve going around the torus, there is no surface for which that curve is a boundary. Do you remember when I, why I'm doing all these, waving my hands? And, if, and, and we drew that avocado without the, the center. And then if you take a curve, even if it goes around the center, you can still find the surface for which that curve is a boundary. Everybody remember that? So if, if you need to, to refresh your memory a bit, go watch that clip on uh, uh, simply connected uh, domains. Okay? That's important now. So if the domain is simply connected, then there's going to be an additional condition. When this was two-dimensional, when f was just p and q, the condition was qx equals py. Remember that? Now, obviously, it's going to be some condition involving all three. So what is this number four? What is this mystery condition? So let's figure it out. Let's see if we can figure it out. By the way, the proof of this theorem at least the first three parts, is completely identical to the proof of the two-dimensional theorem. It's just a bit more fluffier because there's more writing to do because there's three coordinates to everything. But it's the same ideas exactly. Okay, so the, the idea is based on an observation that we made when we discussed the, the, the curl. Okay, so recall that one of the properties of the curl was that if you take a curl of a gradient, it equals zero. And in fact, this is the zero vector. Okay? Remember that? And this is true for the, the function that you're taking here. This is a scalar function. had to be C2. Everybody remember that property? Okay. So, if we're assuming that we're dealing with a conservative field, we know that the field is a gradient. That's property number three, or the third part of this theorem. A conservative, fi a conservative field has a potential function. It is a gradient of some function. Do you agree? Okay. So if f is conservative, then by 3, f equals the gradient of some scalar function. Since, or if we assume, if we assume, if we assume, that f is c1, that's the additional assumption for the equivalence to the fourth property. If we assume that f is c1, then phi is going to be c2, because the components of f are the derivatives of phi, and they're continuous. So they're the second derivatives of, sorry, the components of f are the derivatives of phi. The derivatives of f are the second derivatives of phi, and they're continuous because we're assuming that f is c1, right? So then phi is c2. Therefore, because of this, if f is conservative and is c1, then it's going to satisfy that the rotor of f is 0. So under these assumption, these assumptions, we get that f has zero curl. That's property number four. Okay, so let's go back and write it here. The curl of f equals zero. Okay, so this little argument that we wrote actually proves 
that a conservative field satisfies zero curl. But saying that this is uh, the following are equivalent is saying that all these are if and only if statements. So we still need to argue that if the curl of a field is zero, then necessarily it's conservative. Okay, and this we still need to prove. So what we wrote so far proves that three implies four. Do you agree? Okay, we still need to prove that four implies three, or in fact, we're going to prove that four implies one. That's what we're going to prove. Okay, so um, this proves that three implies four. For the other direction, um, now let's prove the other direction, namely we're going to prove that 4 implies 1. So if you know, if you know that a field has zero curl everywhere in some region V, and you know the assumptions that the field is C1 and that the domain V is simply connected, then you're dealing with a conservative field. Okay? So how would the proof go? Can somebody guess what the idea of the proof is going to be? It should be a one-word answer. Exactly. Exactly. So what do we want to prove? We want to prove one. What does one say? One says the field is conservative. What does it mean for a field to be conservative? That the integral over any closed curve is zero. Right? So let's take a closed curve. Let's give it a name. I suggest gamma. Any objections? And show that the line integral over the closed curve gamma, any closed curve gamma, contained in the domain, of course, of this field is zero. So by Stokes' theorem, by Stokes' theorem, this equals the surface integral of the rotor of F over some domain S for which gamma is a boundary. And since the rotor is zero, that's the assumption in this direction, the rotor is zero, this is going to be zero. Clear? And the conditions that guarantee that Stokes' theorem is valid are F has to be C1. Good, that's one of the assumptions for the equivalence to 4. And we need to be able, given a curve gamma, to find the surface for which gamma is the boundary. And we can do that since we're assuming that it's a simply connected domain. Clear? So Stokes, and let's add here, valid Stokes holds because, because F is in C1 and V is simply connected. I don't know if you can read all these abbreviations. So Stokes' theorem is valid because F has continuous partial derivatives. That's needed for the proof of Stokes. We didn't show the proof of Stokes. And because the domain V is simply connected. And simply connected, again, means that every curve is the boundary of some surface in the domain. OK? So this proves that under these additional conditions of being C1 and the domain being simply connected, these three conditions are equivalent to having zero curl. Now, how do we use this theorem? I'm going to do an example. I'll do it in a separate clip, but let's just review the idea. Basically, the exact same idea is in two dimensions. Same idea. Somebody gives you a field on some domain. If you know that the field is conservative, if you know that the field is conservative, then it's very easy to calculate line integrals, work done by this field over any path. Okay. So usually, we're going to want to check if the field is conservative, and that checking usually is done by calculating the curl. This is just a 
easy calculation of partial derivatives in a 3 by 3 determinant, right? If the curl is zero, then we know that it's conservative. If it's conservative, we can find the potential function. This involves indefinite integrals, finding uh, uh, antiderivatives. Once we know the potential function, once we know phi, we can calculate any line integral by just taking phi at one endpoint and subtracting phi at the other endpoint. That's the idea, exactly the same as in two dimensions. Good? Questions? Okay, so in the next clip we're going to do an example of going through this, this process. And I just want to make one remark. For, for a two-dimensional field, for a two-dimensional field, where f is just pq and there's no r, this condition that the rotor of f is zero collapses to being the, 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 the component of the curl that has only p and q in it is zero. And that component is the z component, which is precisely qx minus py. So if you take a field, if you take your, your, your region to be two-dimensional, your field to be two-dimensional, or, or assume that your field is, uh, has only p, q, and zero for its r component, if you assume that r is zero, what you're going to get here is precisely qx equals py. So it collapses to being the two-dimensional version of this theorem. Okay, see that? Okay. So that's the end of this clip. In the next clip, we're just going to do an example of tracing the process of figuring out that the field is conservative and then finding its potential and calculating line integrals using that.